Yes, sir, man. Y'all know what it is, man. It's your boy, No Moral Victories, man. Mr. Fourth Quarter in the building, man. Today, before we get to video today, I need y'all to like, comment, subscribe, man. I need a million subscribers by midnight. A million. Thank y'all for doing that real quick. And today, video, man, we got the last 24 hours of death row inmates, man. I don't know what we finna get into, man. It's a random one that your boy came across. Let's get straight into it. Subscribe. Final countdown of your life, knowing that... Consider this your sign to stock up on some. Imagine facing the final countdown of your life, knowing that in just 24 hours, everything will change forever. For death row inmates, this is a harsh reality they must confront. Every day for the last 32 years, I regretted what happened. As the hours tick by, we will explore the rituals, the last meal requests, and the final words of those who must die. Jeez. Donald Grant. Please tell about my life. I have to do what I have to do to live because I don't have no damn food. I'm about to die. As the dawn of January 27th loomed, the walls of the Oklahoma State Penitentiary contained not just the physical form of Donald Grant, but the culmination of his life's regrets and fears. The final 24 hours of his existence on death row were a profound psychological journey, a descent into the depths of his psyche. In these final hours, Donald's mind was a battleground. Memories of his childhood, the abuse he suffered. And That's got to be a crazy... The, the cra craziest 24 hours bro this is you literally know you're about to die in 24 hours man you know you're about to die love Damn. he yearned for from a mother lost to addiction all played out like a tragic symphony Damn. he grappled with the duality of his it's nature a, the part of him Charles, that longed man. for redemption and the part that had succumbed to darkness as the time for his last meal arrived the simple act of choosing what to eat took on a profound significance the slice of pizza the peach cobbler and the bottle of pepsi were more than sustenance they were a final taste of a world he was about to leave he Hold on. To choosing meal, what to eat meal. took on a slice profound significance. The slice of pizza, the peach cobbler, and the bottle of Pepsi, Pepsi were more than That's sustenance. Enough, they were a final taste of a world he was about to leave. Each enough. bite was laced with the bittersweet flavor of finality. With each passing minute, the reality Bro, of the bite... Listen, every bite. Look what he, listen to what he say. Laced with the bittersweet flavor laced of finality. With, with butter, each passing minute, the reality of his situation became more tangible. The psychological torment of counting down to one's execution is an experience that few can fathom. Donald was acutely aware of the irreversible nature of time, each tick of the clock a step closer to the end. During his last phone calls, Donald's voice conveyed a mixture of resignation and defiance. He spoke of his life's struggles, the choices he made, and the stark philosophy that had emerged from his experiences. Life is life cannot be killed. A reflection of the harsh lessons learned on the unforgiving Damn. streets. As his family members, including Joe Robinson, prepared to witness his execution, Donald's Jeez. thoughts turned to them. The emotional yeah, weight of wins. saying goodbye, of expressing love and remorse, was a heavy burden. His final words to them, I'm good, don't worry, I'm solid, were an attempt to offer comfort, to assure them that he was at peace. Shit, I don't think you can offer no comfort, man. You finna be RIP'd up out of here. And your family is about to watch that, man. I don't know if I can do that. With his one. fate. I know my next life. Oh, um, I know my next life. Be a better life, you know. I know my next life. Is better. Donald Grant's story is one mired in controversy and tragedy, a life that spiraled into the abyss of criminality. Born into a world that offered little in the way of hope or opportunity, Donald's early years were marked by struggle and survival on the unforgiving streets. He grew up in an environment where the lines between right and wrong were blurred by necessity. The streets were both his home and his adversary, a place where he learned to fend for himself in ways that few could imagine. Donald once recounted how he would scavenge for food, taking discarded scraps just to quell the pangs of hunger, but the hardships of street life paled in comparison to the turmoil he faced at home. In the 1980s, his mother succumbed to the grip of crack addiction, a turning point that fractured the family. Uh, Donald, man. then a child of nine or ten, bore the brunt of a mother's transformation from caregiver to abuser. The beatings he endured were not just physical but emotional, leaving scars that would never fully heal. It was against this backdrop of pain and desperation that Donald's path took a dark turn. In a bid to rescue his then-girlfriend from legal troubles, he concocted a plan that would have dire consequences. Uh -oh. According to court records, oh, on a no. fateful day, Damn. Donald entered the hotel and encountered Brenda McElia, the manager. In a storage room, he shot her before inflicting a final fatal stab wound with a box cutter. Moments later, he confronted Suzette Smith, a hotel clerk, demanding the cash register's contents. After she complied, Donald shot her in the face three oh. times, a brutal act that extinguished two lives and shattered countless others. The trial 
was a somber affair, with evidence painting a grim picture of the events that transpired. The jury was faced with the harrowing task of delivering yeah, a verdict I... on a crime that was both heinous and senseless. In the yeah, end, yeah. Donald was found guilty and sentenced to death. He had pleaded to be executed by firing squad, but was later put to death by lethal injection. The execution began at 10.03 a.m., and Grant was declared unconscious at 10.08 a.m. before his death at 10.16 a.m. Thomas Creech. Hey, man. In the 10 minutes change your whole life right there, my boy. Yeah. of the looming dawn, the state of Idaho oh, stands on the precipice of a moment it hasn't faced in over a decade. Thomas Creech, a name that has echoed through the halls of justice for over 43 years, now counts his final hours on death row. In these final hours, Creech's fate hung in the balance, his life a thread caught in the winds of legal scrutiny. His attorneys emphasize that the execution of a potentially innocent man, or one whose trial was marred by legal errors, would be an irrevocable miscarriage of justice. The state of Idaho prepared to execute its first prisoner in over 10 years. The legal team, the protesters, and those who believed justice was overdue all waited with bated breath for the Supreme Court's decision. In the confines of his cell, a world away from the legal battles being waged on his behalf, Thomas Creech spent his final hours in a state of somber reflection. The walls that had enclosed him for over four decades bore silent witness to the thoughts of a man confronting his mortality. Creech confronting his mortality. Damn. This got to be the worst feeling, man. Aids bore silent witness to the thoughts of a man confronting his mortality. Creech, now 73 years old, had traversed a long and dark road that led to this final day. As part of the final day's protocol, Creech was offered the opportunity to select a last meal. His last meal was fried chicken, mashed potatoes, gravy, and ice cream. He spent the hours leading up to the attempt. As Friday okay. final day's nice protocol, Creech meal. was offered Ain't the opportunity to select a last meal. His last meal was fried chicken, mashed potatoes, yeah. gravy, and ice cream. He spent the hours leading up to the attempt with his wife. As the hours dwindled, the presence of spiritual advisors provided Creech with a measure of solace. These were the hours hey, dwindled. The presence of... I don't know about, you know... Talking ice cream. Nobody, he spent the hours leading up to the attempt with his wife. As the hours dwindled, the presence of spiritual advisors provided yeah, Creech with a measure a of... to advisor, man. That's just really wasting my time. I got 24 hours. This is taking time off the clock right here. These were the individuals who had offered guidance and a non-judgmental ear throughout his time on death row. Creech's reflections were not solely inward-looking. He was acutely aware of the eyes upon him. The prison staff, the legal advocates, the protesters, and the silent observers all waiting for the final act to unfold. Among them were individuals who would bear witness to his execution, a group that included representatives of the law, selected citizens, and, most hauntingly, relatives of his victims. Victims. With less Ooh. than 24 hours remaining before his scheduled execution, the flurry of... Right, that's got to be a great feeling. The victim's family seeing this. It's got to be a great feeling for the victim's family, man. Legal maneuvers reached a Two fever pitch. Of a Preach, coin. the longest-serving death row man. inmate in Idaho, found himself at the center of a legal maelstrom that had been building for over four decades. The legal team argued that there were still unresolved issues in Creech's case that warranted further examination. They contended that the complexity of his legal journey, marked by multiple trials and appeals, had resulted in potential oversights that could mean the difference between life they and death. To... Meanwhile, the Idaho... His last day, they trying to see it. You know, they got all the facts and details of the case. Is correct. The last 24 Supreme hours doing and the that? Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals had already I sealed their positions, appeals. rejecting Creech's appeals. The method of his execution, lethal injection, was a clinical end to a life marred by violence. He was sentenced to death after he admitted to killing 23-year-old David D. Jensen, a fellow inmate at a maximum security prison in 1981. Kevin you Johnson. Inmate? I never heard of that. As the sun set on the eve of November 29th, 2022, the walls of the state prison in Bon Terre, Missouri, stood as silent witnesses to the final hours of Kevin Johnson. This 37-year-old man, whose life had been irrevocably entwined with a fateful decision made 17 years prior, was now at the precipice of his existence, facing the irreversible verdict of death by lethal injection. In a move that defied tradition, Johnson declined the offer of a last meal, a choice that spoke volumes in its silence. Addition, Johnson turned down the last meal. Sheesh. And the offer of a last meal, a choice that, that spoke volumes in its silence. This refusal was not just a rejection of the prison's fare, but seemed to be a statement, a final act of autonomy in a situation where personal control was all but stripped away. 
It was a decision that reverberated beyond the confines of his cell, capturing the attention of the public and adding a layer of complexity to the narrative of his final uh -oh. day. Inside the prison, the spiritual advisor, uh -oh. Reverend Gray, remained at Johnson's side, providing solace through scripture and prayer. Their dialogue was a testament to Johnson's state of mind as he approached his final moments. He expressed apologies to the family of the victim and his kin, conveying a sense of readiness to meet his younger brother once again, who had tragically yeah. passed away years before. The absence of a final statement from Johnson only added to the gravity of the moment. It no final statement, no last meal. That boy was just ready to go, man. Damn. A silence that spoke louder than words. Silence a silence that would be his words. last defiance. His daughter, Corrie Ramey just 19 years old, had fought to be present for her father's final moments, but was barred by a state law that prohibited anyone under the age of 21 from witnessing an execution. The case of Kevin Johnson was marred by controversy and legal strife, with the specter of racial bias casting a long shadow over the proceedings that led to his execution. The legal battles that ensued were not just about the crime for which Johnson was convicted, but also about the integrity of the justice system itself. At the heart of the contention was the role of the prosecuting attorney attorney, Robert McCulloch, whose decisions in seeking the death penalty for Johnson, a black man, were juxtaposed against his leniency towards a white defendant, Trenton Foster, charged with a similar crime. This disparity was the crux of an investigation led by court-appointed special prosecutor E.E. E. Keenan, who was tasked with examining the potential racial bias in Johnson's racial case. Bias. The findings of Keenan's investigation were alarming. They suggested a pattern of discrimination, with evidence that McCulloch's team had deliberately struck black jurors during Johnson's second trial. The first trial had ended in a hung jury, but the second resulted in the death sentence that Ooh. would ultimately be carried out. Keenan's re from the hung jury to death sentence, sheesh concluded racial, that the discrimination was clear and urged the court to vacate Johnson's death sentence, allowing for a new trial that would be free from the taint of racial prejudice. However, the legal system's gears turned slowly and the urgency of the situation was not matched by the pace of judicial proceedings. St. Louis Circuit Judge Mary Elizabeth Ott denied Keenan's motion, citing the proximity of the execution date and the lack of time to properly consider the new evidence. The decision was met with dismay by those who saw it as a failure of the system to address the deep-seated issues of racial inequality. Despite these efforts, the Missouri Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court denied the stays of execution. Missouri Governor Mike Parson announced during the court's hearing that he would not grant clemency, sealing Johnson's fate. Johnson was executed on November 29, 2022, via lethal injection. The execution began at 7.29 p.m., and Johnson was pronounced dead at 7.40 p.m. Robert Frater. Damn, man. Fudge, 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 fudge. Subscribe right now, man. If you haven't done it, what are you waiting for? I don't mind dying at all. In the shadow of the impact. What did you just say? Robert Frater. Robert Frater yeah, I don't mind dying at all. In the shadow of the impending dawn, the Texas State Penitentiary at Huntsville stood as a silent sentinel over the fate of Robert Frater, a man whose life had taken a turn into the abyss of infamy. The final 24 hours of Robert Frater's life were a somber countdown to the irreversible conclusion of his existence. As the sun set on January 9th, 2023, the Damn. walls of the Texas State... Last year? 2023? What the heck? penitentiary at Huntsville enclosed a man whose fate had been sealed by his unthinkable actions. The last day of a death row inmate is meticulously scheduled, each moment leading to the inevitable end. The day began under the watchful eyes of prison guards, who monitored Frater's every move. As per tradition, Frater was granted the privilege of a last meal. His choice was devoid of any grandeur, a simple yet telling reflection of his state of mind. He requested a pepperoni pizza, a garden salad with ranch dressing, and a banana milkshake. It was a meal that would offer no real comfort a final hey man i ain't gonna judge you on that meal get your meal telling reflection of his get state of meal. mind he requested Whatever a pepperoni like. pizza a garden salad with ranch dressing and a banana milkshake it was a meal that would offer no real comfort a final taste of the world he was about to leave behind i followed the instructions of the dream i contacted the mormon church they sent me their book of mormon and Everything that I read matched the information that was given to me in the dream. The uh -oh. time for visitations came, and Frater was allowed to meet with his spiritual advisor. The two engaged in deep conversation, discussing matters of faith and the afterlife. The spiritual advisor offered words of comfort and prayers, a final attempt to provide solace to a soul soon to depart. There was no rumors and affection in our marriage. It was more like, um, I mean, I loved her, I provided for her, I took care of her and everything, but... 
Robert Fratter's descent into darkness began with the disintegration of his marriage. He and Farah Fratter, a 33-year-old mother of three, were embroiled in a bitter divorce that had been filed in March of 1992. The proceedings revealed a tumultuous relationship, marred by allegations of Robert's peculiar sexual fetishes and his unyielding quest for custody of their children. The battle between the estranged couple was fierce, with Farah determined to start anew, free from the man who could not accept her departure from oh, his life. Man, the suburban like tranquility going, of humble Texas... I don't like where this is going man don't tell me you did that to the mother of the kids man Chattered on the evening of November 9th, 1994, Farah Fratter had just returned home from a routine visit to the hair salon, a mundane errand that would unknowingly be her last. As she opened the garage door, she was met with the unexpected, a man with a gun. The assailant fired two shots, one that echoed through the neighborhood and another that silenced Farah's screams forever. She lay in a growing pool of her blood, her life slipping away on the cold cement floor of her garage. The investigation into Farah's murder unraveled a web of deceit that led straight back to Robert Fratter. It's obvious. The first person they're going to ask, you in a divorce, who do you think they're going to ask first, man? Detectives discovered that he had been soliciting individuals to kill his wife, offering money and even a jeep as payment for the heinous act. His address book contained contacts of those he had approached, and an envelope with $1,000 found in his car suggested payment for a dark deed. The breakthrough came when Mary Gipp, the girlfriend of Joseph Prystash, whom Robert knew from the gym, was subpoenaed to testify before a grand jury. With the promise of immunity, she revealed the sinister plot. Robert had first hired Prystash to attack Farrar with a taser gun, an incident that Farrar had reported to the police, suspecting Robert's involvement. Later, Priestash recruited Howard Guidry, Gipp's 18-year-old neighbor, to carry out the murder. The evidence was overwhelming, and Why the jury... gotta bring him in it, man? Why you gotta bring him Howard in? Guidry, Gipp's 18-year-old neighbor, to carry out the murder. The evidence was overwhelming, and the jury found Robert Fratter guilty of capital murder. The sentence was death by lethal injection. At precisely 6 o'clock in the evening, the execution Mother's. procedure commenced. Now the kids ain't got no mom, no pops. Come on, man. It's death by lethal injection. At precisely 6 o'clock in the evening, the execution procedure commenced. The lethal injection was administered. A clinical process designed to end life swiftly. The chemicals flowed through Fratter's veins, and within minutes, his life came to an end. Fratter was pronounced dead at 7.49 p.m. Joseph Mitchell Parsons. As the clock ticked down on his last day on Earth, Parsons, a man condemned to the ultimate... how he worded that, his last day on Earth. As the clock ticked down on his last day on Earth, Parsons... Imagine waking up and you know it's your last day on Earth, man. Like, the most unknown thing you know it's over with. Yo, and condemned to the old, ultimate man. sentence, entered the annals of criminal history. His final 24 hours on death row were a tapestry of somber reflection, fleeting connections, great, and the stark man. reality of a life about to be extinguished. Parsons, who had been a resident of death row for over a decade, was about to become the first person to be executed in Utah's new death chamber. His final oh. day was a scripted routine. Hey, come break in the new death chamber we got for you, man. You talk, break it in with the new dude. Each hour a step closer no to his ultimate fate. The day was spent in a death watch cell, a place where the condemned are kept under close observation as their final moments approach. Here, Parsons engaged in activities under close observation you know as their final time? moments approach. Outside, Here, Parsons sun? engaged in activities that seemed to defy the gravity of his situation. He played cards, delved into games of chess, and conversed with his brother and cousin who had come to be with him during these precious final hours. These simple pastimes were interspersed with moments of quietude, perhaps as Parsons grappled with the reality of his impending demise. They shared his last meal of Burger King hamburgers, French fries, milkshakes, root beer, and chocolate chip ice cream. Parsons attorney he said he believed his client chose this meal because the Burger King slogan, have it I am here to tell you today that have it your way was a reflection of him oh, taking control oh, of his yeah. life. Because the Burger King slogan, have it your way. Oh. Parsons' attorney said he believed his client chose this meal because the Burger King slogan, have it your way, was a reflection of him taking control of his life. Yo, attorney saying that? Why? Come on, man. I'm already finna RIP in a couple minutes. Why are you doing all that, man? of the most poignant moments of Parsons' last day was a brief two-minute phone call with his sister. The narrative that Parsons spun was one of self-defense, claiming that Ernest had made a sexual advance towards him, prompting the fatal altercation. However, this claim did little to sway the course of justice. In the end, Parsons seemed to accept his fate, abandoning his right to further appeals after a decade of legal battles. He chose the death penalty over life behind bars, a decision that would lead him to the final...
Capitals. He chose the death penalty over life behind bars, a decision that would lead him to the final hours of his life in a death watch cell. As the day waned and the hour of execution drew near, Parsons was escorted to the lethal injection room. There, he was strapped to the gurney, IVs were prepared, and the mechanisms of the death penalty were set into motion. It was a clinical procedure, carried out with precision, yet it marked the end of a human life, a life that had been irrevocably marred by violence and loss. Parsons' last words were, love to my family and friends. The witnesses to Parsons' execution included the ex-wife and sister of Richard Lynn Ernest, the man whose life Parsons had brutally taken. Gotcha. They were there to see the final act of a long and painful chapter come to a close. The road to his ultimate demise began in earnest when Parsons, a fugitive parole, found himself hitchhiking across the scorching expanse of the California desert. It was here that fate would intertwine his path with that of Richard Lynn Ernest, a 30-year-old man who had penned short, poignant notes to his nine-year-old son and wife before departing Loma Linda, California. Within 12 hours of their fateful meeting, Ernest would be found stabbed to death his body discarded callously at a rest stop near Parowan, Iron County. The brutality of the crime was stark. Nine stab wounds to the face and chest, a silent testament to the violence that had occurred. At 12.10 a.m. on October 15, 1999, Parsons was executed by lethal injection. Seven minutes later, a physician checked Parsons' stopped heartbeat with a stethoscope and pronounced him dead at 12.18 a.m. John Wayne Gacy. John Wayne Gacy. Want to know the truth and the honesty of it. If they want to be convinced or brainwashed into what they believe, then fine, then go ahead and kill me. But vengeance is mine, say it the Lord. Beneath the shadow of his impending demise, uh -oh. John Wayne Gacy, the notorious death row inmate known as the Killer Clown, faced the final countdown of his last 24 hours. Buckenbridge is not one that I killed, so I don't know nothing about it. Convicted for the heinous murders of 33 young men, oh. Gacy's story is a chilling echo from the darkest corners of criminal history. As a tradition, oh. his last meal was a bucket of original Kentucky Fried Chicken, a dozen fried shrimp, french fries, and fresh strawberries. To wash down on this final feast, he asked for Diet Coke. The choice of such an ordinary meal, laden with the flavors of a life Gacy once knew, stood in stark contrast to the extraordinary so and chilling meal. He didn't get nothing crazy. Kentucky Fried Chicken, a dozen fried shrimp, French fries, and fresh strawberries. To wash down this final feast, he asked for Diet Coke. The choice of such an ordinary meal, laden with the flavors of a life Gacy once knew, stood in stark contrast to the extraordinary and chilling legacy he had crafted. It was a legacy that had led him to this moment, to this sterile room where he would consume his chosen fare, not in the company of friends or family, but surrounded by the cold gaze of prison guards and the sterile gray of the prison walls. As the time for the execution drew nearer, Gacy's final sentiments were recorded. He offered no grandiose statements, no profound apologies, or declarations of innocence. Instead, his words were a reflection of a man who had come to terms with his fate, a fate that was the direct consequence uh -oh. of the path he had chosen in life. Say? His statements words, to his man. legal team and spiritual advisors were the last he would make in a private setting. The last, before he would be led to the execution chamber where his life would end, and where his name would be eternally etched in the annals of criminal infamy. Gacy was escorted into the chamber, his movements deliberate, his face betraying little of the thoughts that raced through his Damn, mind. The method man. of execution, the lethal injection, was a clinical process that belied the violent nature of people. Gacy's crimes. The prison staff performed their duties with mechanical efficiency. Gacy was pronounced dead at 12.58 a.m., nearly an hour after the injection of three lethal chemicals had been scheduled to begin. Timothy McVeigh. Ah, you know, this is getting, this is, uh, hey, hey, hey. I need y'all to subscribe right now, man. Got a couple more minutes on this. I need y'all to subscribe, hey, Am I man. pure evil? Am I the face of terror sitting here in front of you? In the chilling dawn of June 10th, 2001, Timothy McVeigh faced the final countdown of his life. As the first light of day broke through the barred windows of the United States Penitentiary in Terre Haute, Indiana, Timothy McVeigh awoke to face his final day on Earth. The man convicted of the Oklahoma City bombing, which tore through the heart of America on April 19, oh, yeah. 1995, was now confined to the stark reality of his cell, counting down the hours. McVeigh's interactions were limited, controlled, and observed. His final activities were a blend of the mundane and the profound. He spent his last hours in the company of his attorneys and a spiritual advisor, reflecting on his life and the path that led him to this irreversible end. What do you need to be talking to your attorneys for? It's over, man. There's no appeals and nothing going through right now. What is the point of talking to attorneys, man? Bring in my family. Bring in some freaks.
Come on. Bring in the girls, man. This dude finna RIP in 24 hours. Come on. Conversations were private, the content known Come only on. to those within the room, but one could speculate they were laced with discussions of legacy, justice, and perhaps remorse. He was granted the opportunity to make phone calls to those he wished to speak to one last time, a chance to say the things that would otherwise be oh, left call. unsaid. McVeigh reached out to a select few, leaving behind his final words in hushed tones over the line. McVeigh was allowed to shower, dress in clean clothes and attend to his personal hygiene, small dignities afforded to a man about to face the ultimate penalty. As the day waned, McVeigh's final meal was served. He had chosen a simple yet peculiar last request, two pints of mint chocolate chip ice cream. Ice. It was a choice that seemed almost childlike in its simplicity, a stark contrast to the gravity of his situation. On this final day, McVeigh chose silence, making no further statements to the press or the public. McVeigh was transferred to the death watch cell closer to the execution chamber. The warden and official witnesses were notified of their roles, and the execution team rehearsed their duties to ensure a swift and error-free... Hey, real quick, comment right now if y'all seen Green Mile, man. Comment right now if y'all seen procedure. that. As the hour approached, the legal team and McVeigh were informed of the exact timing of the execution. McVeigh was finally executed via lethal injection. Kenneth Eugene uh -oh. Smith. Convicted of a crime that shook the very core of North Alabama, Smith now faces the ultimate penalty. As the clock inched closer to the irreversible moment, Kenneth Eugene Smith's final day on death row began. The atmosphere at Holman Correctional Facility was heavy with the weight of what was to come. Smith, aware of the dwindling hours, spent his time in quiet reflection, punctuated by moments of interaction with those who played a role in his last day. The morning was met with the routine of prison life, but for Smith, it was anything but ordinary. His final breakfast steak hash browns and eggs were served the guards reported he ate little his appetite stolen by the gravity of his situation Ooh. served. Whoo, that's real a boy couldn't eat because he knew it was finna happen man that's the guards real. reported he ate little his appetite stolen by the gravity of his situation eight hours before he was put to death Damn. he received a final visit from his wife and sons on a fateful Ooh. day in march 1988 the tranquility of a small alabama town was shattered elizabeth sennett a 58 year old woman was found brutally beaten and stabbed in her home the investigation quickly led to the arrest of three men among them kenneth eugene smith who was accused of carrying out a contract killing orchestrated by the victim's husband, Smith, along with his co-defendants, faced a jury and the evidence presented was damning. Testimonies and forensic evidence painted a vivid picture of a premeditated murder, one carried out with chilling precision and utter disregard for human life. Before the execution began, Smith made a heart sign with his left hand to his family, who was present before saying his final words through his mask. Tonight, Alabama causes humanity to take a step backwards. I'm leaving with love, peace, and light. As the hour of execution drew near, the atmosphere at Holman Correctional Facility was charged with a sense of history in the making. Kenneth Eugene Smith was set to be the first person in the United States to be executed using nitrogen hypoxia, a method never before tested in the country's penal system be executed using nitrogen hypoxia a method nitrogen hypoxia the first person with that but before tested in the country's Jeez. penal system in the year 2022 smith found himself strapped to a gurney in the very same chamber where he now awaited his fate the execution team in a race against the clock as the death warrant that, neared bro. its expiration proponents then argued that nitrogen hypoxia was a more humane alternative to lethal injection which had become increasingly controversial due to botched executions and difficulties in obtaining the necessary drugs this is all we have for wow, against man. <sighs> like RIP to victims, man. Damn, that's tough. That's got to be a terrible feeling. You know, when you, today's your day. Like, when you know it's your day. <sighs> Thank y'all for watching, man. I need y'all to subscribe, though, for your boy, man. I need a million subscribers by midnight, man. I need it. No other way for me to say that, y'all. Thank y'all, man.